Reggie, are you okay with going to till, till about ten o five to begin? Uh, I'm I'm yours. All right. Whenever you want to start, whenever you want to end. Thank you. Perfect. Let's give it a few minutes and we'll. Well, we don't have to wait for President Biden. He may be a little late. <laughs> <laughs> he might just show up. Wi-Fi on Air Force One. Exactly. So what's his excuse? <laughs> Reg, Reggie, I'm I'm participating on his behalf. Oh, oh good. I thought so. Good. Thank you. Thank you. You know, two okay. Delawareans you know how that exactly. is. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Plus Hector. <laughs> so he may have a few other things on his agenda today. He may not be able to join us. <laughs> but I, he promises next time. Welcome everyone who's joining, who's logging in and getting uh, situated. We'll get started in a few minutes. Davey, good to see you. Same here. Hi. Hi. Hello. hello, hello. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Commissioner Zalma, I see. Good morning. It's Gretchen. Good morning, Gretchen. Gretchen. I see Alma too. Yes. Good morning. Hi, it's Rona. Good morning, Hi. Rona. We'll get started in a couple of minutes. Yeah. Welcome, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome one and all. I, uh, my name is Heran Sarek Abrahan. I serve as the executive director for the Commission on Arts and Humanities and joining me today for our tele town hall. Uh, going forward together is the theme we have for this this morning's tele town hall is our chair, our newly appointed chair, uh, Reggie Van Lee. Um, in a few minutes, he will jump on to say good morning and hello, and we'll get started with our um, presentation for today. As we, as folks begin to log in, I would like to share just a few quick housekeeping uh, notes. It's really good to see uh, old faces and new faces here. Um, but as we as we begin to broadcast this on WebEx and uh, live stream it on YouTube. We would like you for to please um, to, uh, mute your microphones if you're not presenting. And also we will ask that you please turn your cameras off if you're not presenting. Uh, our tech folks are uh, worried about bandwidth, so it might be uh, best, although it's really good to see your faces, to turn the cameras off until the question answer uh, period later on. Uh, Reggie and I will take about 25 minutes each to share our presentations with you. There will be ample time for questions and answers after. 
um, a good, uh, uh, we have about 30 to 40 minutes, 40, 45 minutes set aside for the Q&A and we'll invite you to please um, submit your questions via the chat features, both on YouTube and WebEx. We will be culling the questions from both platforms. <clears throat> and then of course, there's an option to turn on your mic. If we can view your faces, we'll, I think, also be able to turn your microphones on if you prefer to speak. Um, we do welcome feedback and questions throughout the presentation. So as things occur to you, please jot them down in the chat room. Uh, we have staff members who will be monitoring both uh, platforms to uh, uh, gather those questions and present them to us at the very end. Um, so with that, I'll say welcome one and all. This is our first Teletown Hall for fiscal year 2022, 2021, fiscal year 2022, but uh, for this for this um, calendar year. Um, let me pause for a second to invite Reggie to say good morning this morning, and we'll get started with our presentations. Thank you. Well, thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's, this is especially exciting for me because it's not just the first of the fiscal year for me, it's the first period. And I think this session is aptly titled, Going Forward Together is the mantra and the approach that we want to drive going forward. It indeed takes a village to drive the opportunities and issues and challenges we have and developing the ecosystem of arts and humanities in the nation's capital in a way that is sustainable, in a way that all residents enjoy the value of what we can bring to the table is important to us. So none of us have the answer alone. It's gonna take us really working together to get there. So thank you for your participation today. Thank you in advance for your questions and your challenges and your critique, because it will take that for us to get to the right place. So I'm delighted to be here and looking forward to our session. Thank you, Haran. Thank you, thank you, Reggie. So with that, we can get started. Um... Again, for folks who are joining us a couple of minutes into this, this is our uh, teletown hall from the Commission on Arts and Humanities. Going forward together is the theme. I will be presenting some um, highlights of the year that we that just closed out. Our fiscal year begins on October 1st and ends in on uh, September 30th. So uh, I'll be sharing highlights from our the the 2021 fiscal year, and then we will. Um, hear from Reggie on the vision going forward and the energized kind of thinking that's happening now at the commission um, in terms of grant making, in terms of our programs and uh, our direction forward. Um, so staff members, if, if someone could pull up the PowerPoint on the screen, we can get started. Perfect. We can move forward with the slides. I think they got a, a camera full of us both a second ago. So by way of a very quick um, introduction, I, I've been at the commission since 20, 2017. Uh, my name is Heran Sarak Abrahan. I serve as the executive director of the commission. Um, I've been at the commission longer, uh, about four, a little over four years now and at DC government a um, few years longer than that, about seven years altogether. Um, I was initially hired as the senior grants officer here at the commission, um, and, uh, but I've served also in another uh, capacity at the mayor's office on African affairs as deputy director. Uh, my background, my academic background is in history and art history. Um, and over the years, maybe since even uh, a very young age growing up in Ethiopia, I've uh, been involved and around a lot of artists and um, uh, theater, performance arts, music. And at, at later stages in, in, in my life, um, after my graduate school and, and going back and having opportunity to work in Ethiopia at different times, um, I've been deeply involved in projects and programs that um, highlight the work of artists and in, in, in publications and performances, in museums and exhibitions um, over the years on this side as well as, as um, on the African continent. Um, 
I'll move on to the next slide as possible. Um, I, I, I'm hoping to present a br brief background um, to help get us started. For folks who may be new to the Commission, um, the Commission has been around uh, over 50 years, about 52 going on to 53 years. Um, but as of 2019, we um, are now an independent agency within the District of Columbia. Uh, we were a subordinate agency within the executive office of the mayor before that. And our mission is to evaluate and initiate actions on matters related to the arts and humanities um, and to encourage the development of progress in the arts and humanities. And broad as that is, a lot of it, um, a lot of the work takes place through our grant making funding support to arts and arts organizations. And we also uh, do some programs of our own. We support arts education initiatives around the city. We have a very robust public art uh, program that we also support through grant making. Um, and the, so the commission is made up of 18 commissioners and a growing agency of staff members. At this time, we're at about 35 staff members, many of whom have formal training in uh, various arts and humanities disciplines. Uh, we serve as the state arts agency for the District of Columbia, and we are one of the region's largest funders uh, for the arts with, with a budget that's supported primarily through district government funds and in part by the National Endowment for the Arts. Nationally, as most of you know, we are ranked first per, in per capita funding for uh, among the 56 state and jurisdictional arts agencies. And that really does speak to the ongoing commitment of our local governments, uh, our government officials, um, to support the arts through this robust uh, grant making um, support and uh, to support the, our community of artists and arts and humanities organizations. And it's all, you know, all of it goes to um, contributing to our, our quality of life and um, and really making this a destination, the District of Columbia, a world-class city and a destination for the arts. Next slide, please. So today I'll take a few minutes to share some highlights um, in the areas of grant making, both our existing programs and our uh, the, how we funded for relief and recovery to mitigate the effects of the pandemic um, on, on, on artists and our arts organizations. I'll share a little bit also about uh, some progress we've made in embedding uh, values of inclusion, diversity, equity, and access into our work and into our processes. Um, and I'll, I'll also share uh, on some of the new initiatives we've begun um, in the area of community engagement. Uh, all, most of last year, from January to May, uh, we introduced uh, a number of new tracks um, in community engagement that we explored and I think were successful. We successfully explored those. Um, and finally, I'll share some highlights in, in areas that we, we achieved success uh, in building partnerships and, um, and planning uh, our, our sort of next stretch through our strategic plan and our public art master plan. I'll then invite our uh, chair, uh, Reggie Van Lee, to share his vision for the commission in the coming months and years. So as you see with this first slide, in 2021, we awarded nearly 1,000 grants to individuals and organizations, totaling uh, 20, nearly $29 million. Um, this was an increase from the year before, uh, the year before, our, our total grant budget was $27,135,000, um, and uh, our, we haven't quite completed pushing out all of our grants for this year, but um, the numbers are sure to go over that 1,040 uh, awardees for sure. So this indicates many good things. It means new folks are coming into the fold um, in terms of being able to use the resources, apply for grants successfully, and uh, uh, be supported through the funding. Um, and it also means that our reach is, is, is expanding a little bit, which is really good, good news. Our budget is growing. That's also really good uh, for everyone. So this is sort of a snapshot of the year before in terms of our numbers of grant awards. Next slide, please. The effects of the pandemic 
we're still really uh, assessing uh, what that is. They, they, we just, you know, people were really slammed, individuals, organizations. There was just, it was just unprecedented in terms of folks trying to navigate that and, and remain open and working. Um, and so the, uh, we've put a lot of focus, the commission, um, on relief funding, recovery funding, and really supporting people through uh, the the effects, the negative effects of this uh, pandemic. And so as you see here, we provided uh, some funding for individuals um, and as well as organizations. And we, um, so we were able to, um, pardon me one second, my slide is covering. We provided grants to individuals and organizations, and we tried to build as much staff support around the um, application processes as we could. And you see this in the success rate, 94% uh, of, of our applicants to our CAH relief and recovery grant were awarded um, to, to a total of 266 individuals. We put a lot of thought into making those um, very quick application processes. Uh, we pushed as hard as we could to get payment out really quickly to individuals. Um, and and then we also worked with council on the facilities and buildings relief grant to be able to designate some of this le legislated grant to uh, relief and uh, to respond to what we saw as needs around rent and mortgage relief. So that was another success story. Some new um, organizations came into the fold that way as well with this new FAB relief, facilities and buildings relief grant. Next slide. So as you can see for organizational grants, we had a total um, enhancement, which was uh, additional funding we were able to make available uh, of $4.1 million really based on feedback from community members. Um, I, I can comfortably say that it went a, a long way in keeping the lights on and in sustaining programs for uh, various organizations. Our total relief funds, 7.3 million, is really a testament to how thoughtful the commission has been in um, anticipating and seeing what the need is in the community as it related to uh, post-COVID and post-pandemic recovery. Um, and it's a staggering amount, really, thinking through, you know, sort of the processes and everything that was in, involved in, in pushing out this money. Um, so this is a testament to the work of the commission and staff and uh, the feedback that we got uh, from community as well to indicate where the needs were. Next slide, please. In the area of inclusion, diversity, equity, and access, um, as many of you know, the commission uh, staff members and community members were um, involved in a six month long um, discussion around how uh, can we be more thoughtful? How can we embed these values more firmly in our processes, in our practices here at the, uh, at the commission? And so uh, after six months of conversation and discussion, uh, we were able to present in December 2020, a set of recommendations uh, that the commission unanimously agreed on, signed off on, um, and so we got to work. And um, to date, we have about 18 of the 44 recommendations uh, moving or completed. Um, and so the next, you know, the next task is really to map out the remaining recommendations um, against uh, capacity and uh, and uh, urgency even to complete all of the 44 recommendations that the task force has made uh, to improve and to strengthen our, our practices with equity at the center of it. Uh, the discussions were facilitated by our, our current chair, Reggie Van Lee. Um, and so uh, he was really sort of at the center of uh, moving things forward then. And so it's very fitting that uh, he continues to uh, guide that that movement forward now. Um, we have made steady progress in, in, in centering equity in our grant making. 
um, and are uh, creating new platforms and opportunities for community outreach and uh, improving our communications in general. Um, next slide, please. So as many of you who might have applied to our general operating support grant through your organizations would have already seen, we included a weighted uh, criteria, review criteria in our grant program applications uh, for general operating support to really be able to uh, uh, address the issue of equity and the work that organizations are doing towards equity um, in their own realms. Um, We've worked also to uh, improve our grant uh, program deliveries. Uh, we've worked to broaden access through um, lengthening the hours that the applications, the hours, days, and weeks, even in some cases, that the application windows are open. Uh, we've also begun for the first time collecting demographic data. As we have an ear to other state arts agencies and sort of where they are on this uh, IDEA journey, many, many state arts agencies had not uh, collected demographic data. Um, over the years, this, was a, this wasn't a practice that most had focused on. So I think we moved fairly quickly to begin collecting demographic data. And of course, all of what we will see and analyze from that demographic data will inform our, our policy and our practices um, moving forward. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of our community engagement, in a way, the um, the COVID timing and uh, switching to online programming and, and virtual uh, presentations did help um, the logistics aspect of some of the community engagement we were able to do. Uh, we rolled out three tracks, one of which was an existing track, Business of the Arts, which happened in, in, in person live here in our uh, building. Uh, but we were able to experiment with a, a couple of other uh, tracks, engagement tracks, um, Artist Showcase and CAH in the community. All of these, you know, sort of community engagement initiatives were basically designed to share resources and provide professional development opportunities um, to the community at a time that things looked like they were shutting down, really, and also to be able to shine a spotlight on our artists and fellows as they continued to uh, work, you know, through the pandemic. So uh, you might think, you might remember that um, in April we did a program at the Lincoln Theater. We we're able to go and tape this live um, with uh, our writers, our poets, and jazz musicians participating, paired up and and working together to create uh, something new together, um, which was really successful. It was successful in the sense that it brought us back into community. It uh, created a, a, a spark, you know, between artists um, in a new way. And of course, April was National Jazz and Poetry Month. And so it was fitting that we got to celebrate both um, art forms this way. Um, our, our sessions on our art bank collection um, had have, have, had been really successful. People had tuned in to learn about our 3,000 uh, pieces strong uh, collection, Art Bank collection, the history of the collection. So our public art team re really did a good job of, of um, sharing um, the, the history of, of, of the, these assets that we have here at the uh, commission. We also had a number of really uh, successful arts education networking sessions that were well attended. And so we got good feedback from audience members. Uh, we plan to continue to do this type of programming, hopefully also in person, uh, online, but also in person in the coming months. Next slide, please. Beyond grant making, um, there are a number of areas. We, we always do challenge ourselves um, to think about what is it we do beyond grant making. Obviously, we have a lot of um, um, expertise, knowledge, um, and um, resources that can be shared beyond the actual dollar, dollar, uh, dollars that go out through grants. And so here, I've just pulled uh, a few of these highlights to share. Um, we have increased our visibility through YouTube um, um, broadcasting and through um, uh, 
sharing what's happening with the with the commission in real time with the public. We've made the technology work in a way that is um, uh, beneficial to to increase access. Uh, we have also this was a long time uh, sort of desired uh, project to create a new website. Uh, we were able to work with Octo to get that up and running um, and. Uh, we we also you know successfully completed uh, two areas of planning that uh, we had hoped to do you know uh, it was delayed by a year because of COVID but we did finally um, um, complete both our strategic planning and our public art master planning for um, the, the, the which will give us sort of a, a roadmap for the three years um, before us uh, beginning from this year. Um, next slide, please. Um, two new things that uh, we we tried and and uh, were able to uh, push through, and really uh, we're excited about these two two new sort of um, areas we've explored. Um, in I think in 2020, probably there was an uh, an uh, opportunity to apply for a grant program which was offered through the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies um, in partnership with Aroha Philanthropies, leveraging state investments in creative aging, LISCA. And this was a grant program that was designed to serve our older adult communities through arts learning. Um, this was sort of our first foray into applying for a grant outside of our um, NEA partnership. And what it did was it provided uh, an opportunity to really focus on our district's older adult community and uh, provide professional development opportunities for them uh, through um, uh, through local artists pairing with them and and they learning uh, new uh, skills through art art learning through through the arts and so in partnership for the arts for the aging we are now we've launched the program we have 10 teaching artists that, that are participating and they're training to create a curriculum that they will then share in uh, subsequent work workshops at uh, local senior centers so we're really excited about that new um, new initiative also in uh, this year we uh, participated we we applied to our nea regular partnership um, cycle and this year, uh, the, well, the year before, the NEA required that state arts agencies uh, include a traditional or folk art component in their uh, partnership application. And so we explored this possibility of focusing on our city's official music as designated in February 2020 uh, by our, our mayor, Muriel Bowser, GoGo -Go Music. And so we developed this proposal to work with Howard University's Department of Communication, Culture and Media Studies. Uh, the proposal was approved and awarded. And though there are a few examples of, of uh, state arts agencies partnering with universities for their folk life programming, uh, this marks the very first partnership of, 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 of this kind with a historically black college or university. And it's also really unique in focusing on uh, an urban art form. Um, so this this brainstorming really came about from uh, internal conversations here with staff, but also uh, we have um, in our uh, commissioner, Natalie Hopkinson, uh, someone who has contributed consistently to uh, scholarly research and public advocacy on GoGo. -Go. Um, and so she was a, a, a really good partner to flesh out these ideas with and to, um, you know, put in the application in a way that we see it, you know, we see the, 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 the program are actually taking shape over the three years in a way that will really institutionalize and um, support the work around uh, go-go music, but also broadly around expressive culture, um, studying and, and preserving and documenting expressive culture of, of uh, communities of color here in the district. Next slide, please. Um, I'm coming close to the end of my presentation. This last slide is one which gives an update on um, our grant program uh, programs or, or our grant awards activities uh, beginning on October 1st. 
which is our fiscal year 2022. Um, so here you'll see that on October 1st, we, we did manage to push out about close to 700 uh, grants um, out the door. Uh, what's really exciting about this is there's a, a, a big jump in our numbers for um, new uh, applicants and awardees, 12% uh, movement in new folks uh, coming into uh, the realm of funding, which is really good. And so, so far we have awarded uh, 25,256,000 grant dollars uh, for this fiscal year. I know the questions are coming in. Thank you for that. Continue to please uh, uh, provide us with your questions. We will uh, set aside time at the end of, of Reggie's uh, presentation to turn to those questions. Um, as we make a transition now, it is my pleasure to welcome back our, new, our chair, uh, Reggie Van Lee. Um, and if you would please go to the next slide, I'll just do maybe a a more formal introduction of Reggie, uh, who's been on board. I don't know if you can read this text is really small, but um, he's been on board since July 1st. He's hit the ground running with his ideas, as you can see, to invigorate the vision of the of the commission um, and to uh, continue to work uh, towards these these big goals that we've set uh, for ourselves in serving the community. Uh, Reggie is a partner and chief transformation officer at the Carlisle Group. Before joining the Carlisle, he spent over 30 years at Booz Allen Hamming, Hamilton, uh, leading several business units and uh, working across multiple industries. He's a longtime philanthropist and supporter of the arts. He serves in several boards, both in New York and Washington, D.C., including uh, the museum, the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Coalition of African Americans in the Performing Arts, Juilliard School and the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, among others. Um, it's been a uh, really energizing stretch of time that we've had with him. I've I particularly appreciated um, everything that he, um, you know, sort of the 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 positive energy that he's bringing with him into working on these uh, goals and his stamina. Um, I've appreciated that as well. So without any further ado, Mr. Reggie Van Lee. Well, thank you, Haran. Thank you. Some people find my stamina exhausting, so apologies in, in advance if that's the case. And just a little bit more on me. I came to the arts as a dancer, having started ballet training when I was four years old and you know, studying as a dancer and eventually going on to do a year of dancing uh, with Alvin Ailey which was 41 years ago. So please do not ask me to perform and expect me to perform like an early dancer. That was 41 years ago. But I've been the uh, part of the fabric of the DC arts uh, scene for 15 years or so. Um, having served and currently serving on the board of the Kennedy Center, having served on the board of Washington Performing Arts, Washington Ballet, the Washington National Philanthropies, uh, Kappa, as you talked about before the coalition of African Americans in the performing arts and being a support of many other organizations. So I bring great passion to this position because I've been a participant in this market in this area for 15 years. And now I'm really honored to serve as chair of the, uh, the commission. Why don't we go to my first slide where I want to begin to share with you um, what we are here to do. And it's important to me that this is both seen as and in substance is a collective agenda for going forward. This comes from the almost 900 interviews that were done during the work of the task force on equity, inclusion, and belonging, conversations with many organizations across uh, Washington, DC, conversations with our staff, and with ongoing conversations with the full community. And our intention is to find the most efficient and effective way to have this ongoing dialogue with the community to, to make sure that we're evolving what we do at the commission in the right sort of way. That's why sessions like this are so important and your questions are gonna be very important. I've been watching the chat and seeing the questions coming in and we intend to answer all of the questions that have come to us to the extent that we can. So this is about a collective agenda and I want you to keep us honest in making this agenda collective. Let's go to the next page. When I think about the collective agenda, from the work that was done and the conversations that have been had, there are three important pillars to that. The first is, as Haran said, we are an independent agency 
to a large extent, but we recognize there's a high interdependence between this commission and the council, between this commission and the office of the mayor, amongst the commissioners ourselves, amongst the staff, between the commissioners and the staff, and obviously within the arts and humanities community of DC. So what we want to do is to drive a governance structure that reflects that interdependence and to always behave in the way that says there's much more strength in us working together and driving this collective agenda together. So that interdependence we want to stress in spite of the fact that officially we are an independent agency. The second is the strategic plan that Haran talked about, which really infuses in us this notion of how we can best be a leader amongst the state's agencies, arts and humanities agencies across the country. That as Haran said, our budget per capita is larger than any other, a certain in the top three, according to how you look at the numbers. And that gives us an opportunity to really have a leadership position. And our intention is to have that leadership position and to have a strategy that reflects that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in subsequent pages. And lastly, the recommendations from the task force, which I did lead and therefore have great interest in making sure those recommendations are implemented. Uh, those are really the sort of recommendations and actions that will set us apart from many of the other agencies and deliver to the residents of DC a fully equitable approach to how these funds are distributed. And so we want to push that really hard. Uh, in my world, three things are the most that you can do in any one breath. And so we're going to try to focus on those three. Why don't we go to the next page? The first pillar is the governance one. We want to fully recognize the interdependence, as I, said, as I said before, across the various entities that represent the arts, humanities, community in Washington, D.C. We're enhancing our bylaws to reflect that, to make sure that from a pure written governance standpoint, we do that. Uh, we are scheduling a board retreat, which I have renamed a board advance, uh, that will bring the commissioners together so that we can continue to think through uh, in harmony how we move ahead and how we deliver against the needs and the requirements of our community. Uh, a number of social events we've set up. Uh, in the month of September, we had many events, an event at the Kennedy Center, uh, part of our Art All Night, uh, part of other uh, meetings and, and interactions we've had across the, the city to make sure that we're really driving the sort of camaraderie that we need to reflect in the commission, that people that have spent time together in a personal way always work together better as well. So those social events we think are really important in driving team building and camaraderie. Um, the way that the committees of the commission have been reassigned is in a more democratic approach where each commissioner has volunteered where he or she wants to serve and they've come together in those committees. Then those committees have voted in who their chair would be. Historically, I as chair have put people on committees and had people to chair the committee by my selection. And we've decided that we wanted to do a more democratic process this year, once again, in the spirit of being inclusive and working together. So the committee assignments really reflect the desires and needs and skills of the various commissioners. Uh, I will do quarterly one-on-ones with each of the commissioners to make sure we are driving this agenda in the right sort of way. And uh, we've had our first uh, success in re-engaging with the mayor's office through active participation in the mayor's arts awards, which is something we used to lead we went through a different period and now we're trying to get to a period where we have that level of engagement. So the number of things that are driving this interdependence and us really driving the effectiveness of this organization and the energy and the vitality that we need to reflect as an arts and humanities organization. Next slide. The strategic plan. Again, this is our opportunity to clearly be a leader in ensuring all the DC residents benefit fully from the transformative power of the arts and humanities. And I know that sounds lofty, but I think that's what we aspire to. This is taxpayers' money that is funding us, and therefore we owe it back to those taxpayers to have them to really experience, in whatever form or fashion it might be, the transformative powers of arts and humanities. For me personally in my life, I've seen that, and I'd love for everyone to have that experience as well. Uh, the GOS funding opportunities is not only going to the large organizations, but more going to small organizations as well in the spirit of capacity building and sustainability. So we're trying to find a way to serve all of the grantees in a significant way, in particular to help small organizations that need that capacity building. Uh, find ways to support our grantees beyond just the grants to help them with 
uh, finding housing or help them with finding health benefits. Those things that will drive their success beyond just the dollars. This is the spirit of teaching them to fish as opposed to just providing them fish. So we want to both provide fish and teach them to fish. More intentional diversification of our panels. Uh, we have had some level of diversity in the panels that uh, decide on the grants, but we are being yet more intentional and more proactive in diversifying those, those panels. Uh, we would like to be able to showcase some of the grantees at each of our monthly meetings. And we're hoping the next meeting or two, we can bring that to the meetings. So that we're reminded of why we're there. It's not just about looking at the financials of the organization or dealing with some of the business issues, but rather appreciating the fact that we are here to support the arts. And so we want to bring our grantees into those meetings to help remind us of that and to give them a platform as well. This truth and reconciliation mantra is quite important because there are harms that we've discovered that have been done to a number of grantees from the 900 or so interviews we did, uh, um, surveys and questionnaires we did during the diversity work, we found there are people who felt they've been harmed by the way some of the policies have come down. And these are not necessarily intentional. These are not necessarily authored by us. These may have been vestiges of prior administrations or, or work that has come down over the 50 or so years. So we want to, instead of being denial, experience denial over that, we want to have a spirit of truth and reconciliation. Whatever harms may have been done, we are here to fix them. They're proactively wanting to fix it and not in denial around it. Uh, we would like to create what I'm calling a creative economy working group so that we really understand how the creative economy can play in this city. That even though one may not become an artist, studying the arts could make you a better doctor, lawyer, butcher, social worker, any sort of profession you'd follow. I would argue that in my field, first as a consultant and now in financial services, uh, my training in ballet gave me poise and determination and stamina, et cetera. And that training that may have come from the arts can find itself into driving the financial economy of a region as well. So this notion of the creative economy, we want to drive, we want to create a working group to do that. And we would invite many of you to participate in that as well. And again, we find there's a lot of good work that the commission has done that doesn't necessarily see the light of day, that people aren't aware of. I, I was surprised with, at Art All Night, the number of people that don't realize the big role that this commission plays in Art All Night. And so there's an aggressive communication plan that we want to put in place so that people understand who we are, what we do, how we can be helpful to them, how they can connect with us, and to really appreciate the, the energy uh, that's put forth and the resources that are put forth towards the arts and humanities in Washington, D.C. So it is a robust strategic plan that we're addressing, uh, but we enter it with great energy, and we're going to do all we can to manifest all the elements of the plan that exist. Next page. The task force recommendations. Quite simply, as, as Ron said, 18 of the 44 are either implemented or in play. And our goal is over the next year or so to get through all 44. Uh, some of them are very aggressive. Some of them do take a longer time frame. So we aren't suggesting we can get them all done uh, in the first year, but we're making great effort already and pushing harder to get those things done. Uh, that uh, Those actions and timelines need to be resourced and it needs to be aligned with the staff bandwidth and capacity so that we have a realistic, pragmatic plan. But uh, know for sure that great energy is going around the task force recommendations and implementing them. Next page. So this clearly is shifting the paradigm for the commission. And in our opinion, it's shifting it in a positive way, uh, in a way that not only reflects the trend that we see across the country, but uh, gives us an opportunity to, to step even ahead of the trend, to be a, a pace maker, to set the trends for the rest of the country. We have both the desire, the energy, the funding to do that, and we aspire to do that with your help. Again, none of this can be done on our own. We don't have all the answers ourselves. We can't hypothesize all the issues that need to be addressed. So we need your active participation, your involvement, your critique, um, and your advice. And with that, I'll turn it back to Iran. Thank you. Thank you, Reggie. Uh, we are doing really well with time. Uh, thank you all for um, uh, 
following along and for providing us with your questions. Um, we have a good stretch of time, uh, about 45 minutes from this point, to uh, take your questions and uh, answer them as best we can or, or uh, be able to provide answers down the road. We don't have the answers readily available. Um, so I think, is it you, Jeff, who might be um, hunting questions our way? Sure. So uh, one of the first questions off the bat, um, the task force recommendations, are they available somewhere for the public to read and review? Yes, they sure are. They're on our website. Um, you can find them. I can pull up the website really quickly. I can give you some specific instructions. Um, but they are posted on our website. Um, I think they're <laughs> about CAH, yes. Or even perhaps on the landing page. I don't know if I can pull it up right this moment. Yes. It's on our about CAH uh, 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 view, I guess, or or page. If you go on our website, you'll see it. Um, equity, inclusion, and belonging about CAH. It's listed there. So please do read I wonder, it. I, I wonder if Jeff, if Jeff could put that onto the chat, uh, the link that can send people directly to that. That's to the website. perfect. Yep. Mm -hmm. Jeff, if you could do that, or someone could do that. That'll be helpful. Uh, next question we have here, uh, will CAH increase grant funds for the East of the River grant? Everything is under consideration. We are uh, working through across all our grant programs through the committee, uh, grants committee um, of our uh, group of commissioners and staff as well. We have a, a full, you know, sort of grant staff that works with the committee to uh, address and redress and continue to calibrate what funding looks like across the, the various grant programs. So I don't know if I can say, you know, get ahead of anything to say this is what, what's going to happen um, as it's a process and it's a lot of discussions that take place. We look at um, uh, patterns of the past, we look at need, we look at um, um, applicant numbers uh, for various grant programs. Um, and we have made changes in most grant programs. So the, so the, you know, the basic answer is yes, we're constantly looking and calibrating uh, across our grant programs what's possible to do uh, with our, uh, with our uh, funding. So likely yeah. year to year there's tweaks and changes and likely there will continue to be. Yeah, one thing I might add, Haran, and I think you're exactly right. But certainly to the extent we are focused more on capacity building and sustainability, and there will therefore be funds towards smaller organizations that are driving that capacity building and sustainability. And to the extent, almost by definition, we have smaller organizations in east of the river, that would suggest that, yes, there will be funds flowing there, but not just because it's east of the river, but because it is an organization that is driving capacity building and sustainability, and they have addressed the equity lens that we place on all of our grants. And when those qualifications come through, people will get funding. I think that that will suggest increased funding east of the river. Thank you. Perfect. So the next question, uh, in the 2021 DC public art plan update, a uh, key recommendation suggests the deep, uh, deep, deep prioritizing, sorry, the protected class of individuals with disabilities. The language is, quote, applicants must demonstrate how its programming and services will be inclusive, diverse, equitable, and accessible throughout the District of Columbia beyond participants with disabilities. Can you ex explain this? I'm not sure I understand. Um, I know more broadly that the Public Art Master Plan has um, has included and incorporated the IDEA uh, values and discussions that were happening um, before the consultants came on board. So both the strategic planner and the public art master plan consultant looked at those um, equity values to incorporate those. I'm not sure I have a, a direct answer for that reference that that you read, though, um, Jeff. In general, though, you know, I think what the public art master plan is trying to do through the programs um, and through broadening sort of, um, and I know a lot of discussion happened around 
what do you do for folks who cannot apply, cannot apply for various reasons, um, not necessarily disability focused access, but access in general, and what might uh, mitigate the uh, just the sheer density of some of our public art uh, program applications and processes and what's needed to uh, run uh, a site specific project. And so we have had good conversations around um, creating ramp up opportunities for new applicants, uh, but that doesn't quite get to uh, the, the question on disability. Yeah, I, I think we need to go back and understand what that is and, and get back to the to answer that question specifically yes. because yeah. it, it I hope that I'm not reading it in the way that uh, makes it seem like a negative or deprioritization. Right. That certainly is not the intention. No. So we need to fix it. We okay, so we have a question, a question from YouTube, uh, our audience watching us on the live stream. Is CAH anticipating any follow up on the music census? This was the, the census that was completed, I think, through the uh, OCTFME, the Office of Cable Television, Film, Music and Entertainment. That's it's uh, a, a couple yes. Of years back. I remember, I remember the census and I remember the. Uh, the push that was happening to get folks, musicians to uh, respond to it. That's a good question. I think we that's it's an opportunity to uh, partner with OCTFME to see and maybe even they may have already done a an analysis of the data that they've collected. So uh, we will circle back to them. This is a good suggestion. Um, I'm noting it down. It's an opportunity to to. Uh, partner with them and see what the data is showing and telling us about musicians and the challenges they're facing in the city. Thank you. So with the new grant, uh, with the new initiatives that, that were discussed in today's uh, pre uh, presentation, will the grant timelines be changing uh, based on any of these initiatives? And is there uh, any opportunity for uh, current or former gr grantees to give their feedback in the process as, as the uh, development is going through? Um, the grants committee will be leading the charge in um, engaging community around uh, feedback for the grant programs. Um, I will say, though, that the uh, the cycles are set the way that they are to allow us to um, make awards at the beginning of the district's fiscal year, which is October 1st. And so with that timeline in mind, we push back up through um, all of the city administrators' uh, um, requirements as to how long a grant has to be uh, open, when it should be announced, how long it needs to be announced. There's a whole lot of, it's a good 13, 14 week process. And so the reason it falls where it does is because we uh, work our way backwards from that October 1st deadline. That October 1st de deadline is is something we are committed to, so that grantees are able to quickly, you know, hear about their, their you know, get notification on their on their awards, and uh, as quickly as possible get the money in their hands to go on and do their their projects. And so there's a little bit of a uh, of a lock in for that date to work, October 1st to work. And then um, there's there's some requirements from the city administrator's office that we have to comply uh, comply with. So that some of the timeline is determined because of that. Uh, we had a few questions about the Sister Cities grant program. Do we think that's going to be coming back? <laughs> it's a million dollar question. I hope so. I, I've always appreciated the international aspect of that uh, of that program. Um, as many know, the 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 districts uh, this is probably the very the only uh, project that funds artists to do work with international counterparts um, that I know of in in the nation. Um, it, I, you know it is it is a really incredible program for collaboration of artists. Um, across, you know, uh, disciplines and across geographic space. Um, and so I hope, you know, the, the travel and, and all of the sort of the COVID related restrictions, once they're lifted, we're able to make an assessment around uh, what, what to do 
um, for our grant programs, and that will be one of the ones that will be under consideration uh, with, with our commission. If I could just say one thing, Haran, I think with respect to the grant process going forward, we are just coming out of having finished the grants for this year and beginning the conversations and the thinking around what might the new process look like. So I, I, I'm reading some of the chat questions. I appreciate people are anxious to understand how might things look going forward. But at this point, we don't know for certain. We do know that it wants to be an inclusive process. We'll be getting back to the community and how you can be involved in the process of how we rethink the grant process, but where it will land, you know, whether it changes the timeline, where there'll be increases, decreases. I mean, we don't really know at this point. We are just beginning to look at that, but trying to look at it now that we have the bandwidth to do that, haven't gotten the grants out for this year. Thank you, Rich. And so, Reggie, could you go into a little more detail about any uh, upcoming changes to the mayor's arts awards that you may be aware of? Uh, similar answer to the, the answer I just gave that our first uh, attempt to re-engage with the mayor's office was being invited to present at the mayor's arts awards. And so we're in conversation with the mayor's office about what might that mean going forward? How might we be involved? And so I can't really tell you now, but in the months to come, we will be able to. And, and Reggie, it might be an opportunity to also say our commission meets uh, once a month, every month. There is an opportunity to come in and speak to commissioners um, in, in real time. Um, there's a public uh, presentation uh, period at the beginning of each commission meeting. So for folks who may not know that, that's also another opportunity to really come and engage with us um, and and give us your perspectives and viewpoints on on the work that the commission is doing. Um, you're You're all very welcome to Come right now, we're doing things um, uh, virtually. And so um, please sign up as possible to continue conversation with us. So we have a question about the Create and Thrive uh, initiative. Are all 10 of the teacher teaching artists working specifically at senior centers? And if not, could you clarify where they are working? Uh, Yes, the program uh, is designed. It's not our program. It's something that we applied for to get uh, a little bit of grant money uh, to conduct the program. And so the program's parameters are uh, that the uh, there uh, that the awardees provide art uh, learning opportunities for older adults. And so uh, we have ten teaching artists uh, that have been um, selected and paired to begin the process of crafting the curricula for these workshops that will be conducted in um, in our uh, in, in a senior center that's going to partner with us. We will share more information um, as we get closer to rolling this out because it is an important uh, part of our community uh, that we haven't intentionally focused on before. Uh, but but it's a it's a, you know older adults have been affected maybe disproportionately with, by uh, the isolation that has happened around uh, COVID. And so this is an attempt to, uh, the, the, the grant program itself is an attempt to address some of that and, and create learning opportunities through the arts. So please stay tuned. We will continue to uh, share um, the progress of, of our work with this, within, with this grant program um, as, it, as it moves forward. So we have another question um, from our YouTube audience. Uh, this one is the music community has been seeking a music commission to address the spectrum of industry sectors and navigate the various grant government agencies. Is this an endeavor CAH would participate in or lead? Um, I can, I can make yes. a stab at that. I think we certainly would like to participate in. Yeah. Um, I, I'm nervous about offering up to lead in too many areas, but certainly is something we want to participate in. And in that participation, we can jointly come to the conclusion of, is there a leadership role that's appropriate for us or not? And again, we would, we would encourage the leaders of these initiatives to come and speak to us, come and present to us and see where there might be opportunity to uh, partner or to even leverage, you know, sort of our our uh, resources and connections and uh, the standing of the commission, you know, to kind of at least at minimum spread the word and and uh, facilitate some of the conversations as possible. So uh, please keep us informed and and uh, 
and let's continue in conversation so we can support these initiatives for artists. And, and for industry. those who know me know that I'm anxious to do everything. I'm reminded of the little poem of the little boy that says, the ocean is so big and my boat is so small. Uh, and so we just have to make sure that we can do, because we want to do well, whatever we do. Right. And we need to get everything on the table, do some prioritization, have an understanding of the role we can play and perhaps the role that others can play, the partners, the alliances, et cetera. Uh, but we want to address these issues, but in a way that will drive to some sustainable solutions. So, so the good news here is Reggie's sounding more like me, <laughs> which I like. <laughs> Because I'm always like, oh my God, Reggie, what, what, you know? So this is a, a good shift we're seeing, folks. The answer is always in the middle, Haran. The answer yes. is always in. Yes. No. This is the, the the good thing is there's commitment, there's energy, there's there's a lot of um, thoughtful people who are who are pushing. We're all pushing in the in the same direction. So that that makes it, um, you know, fun and exciting too. Uh, do we know if the FAB rent relief grant program will continue next year? We are internally having conversations about that right now, uh, believe it or not. The, um, there is, it's again, you know, sort of a grants committee uh, initiative uh, to lead. We will be in conversation, staff will be in conversation uh, with the grants committee members and eventually the whole commission. Uh, but, but I, my sense is that the need continues, uh, that the recovery hasn't quite happened for our organizations out there. And so um, it's it's definitely a consideration right now. Is there any suggestions on how to gain greater accessibility to the staff? Uh, and is there uh, any way to reach out directly to the commissioners as well? Uh, definitely, there is, right now we are in a partial telework situation for the agency, uh, just to be very mindful of, um, you know, sort of the stresses that staff are facing um, to adjust uh, around, you know, changing news around uh, COVID and 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 uh, uh, the uh, Delta virus and all of that. And so, uh, physically meeting with staff is still possible. I would encourage uh, emailing. Folks that you're interested in meeting with, and we can make arrangements here at the office. Um, there's also opportunity to uh, reach out to commissioners. Um, we have their emails listed on our website, um, and then presenting at the commission meetings is another option. So yes, I mean there's all kinds of opportunities too. And the one thing I'll add, Haran, is in the task force recommendations, there are a number of recommendations about the commission in the community and how we can go out and connect with the community. We need to implement it. We need to find funding for it, et cetera. But uh, please look at those recommendations as well and see if implemented, those would address the concern that you're talking about, in addition to what Haran said. Mm -hmm. And I think as as this, you know, as the city continues to open up and people's levels of comfort kind of uh, begin to increase in meeting with person, we are really looking at opportunities to be out in the community in a regular way, not connected to the grant cycles, but timing, but um, throughout the year to be stationed to have kind of office hours types type of things uh, with staff members out in the community at various, you know, uh, organizations, arts organizations or library uh, spots to uh, just provide information about the, what the commission does in a regular way so that people are, you know, gearing up if they're thinking of applying for our uh, grant programs that they have ample time and um, ample information to begin to think about becoming a grantee. Jeff, if, if I may, and I have to rib David Yarbrough, who sent a note about my being involved in some senior citizen jazz ensemble program. I'm not sure what you're trying to say, Davey, but no, I, I'd be happy to be involved in it. And actually, I was one of the founders of Jazz Houston, a jazz organization in Houston, Texas, that focuses on that as well. So uh, you know how to reach me. I'm happy to talk to you about that. David, and anyone else or... wants involved? Anyone to involve me in some senior citizen activity? Please feel free to. I won't be offended by it. <laughs> Davy is one of our teaching artists for this uh, program, actually. So, and then Davy was a member of the task force in equity, yeah. inclusion, and belonging. So, right. thank you for your service, Davy. My pleasure. Uh, is there any insight that you can share on uh, strategic synergies amongst uh, CAH and the NEA or uh, going this currently going on or in the past 
should people apply through both platforms and which for what? Oh, wow. That's a huge question. Uh, yes, well, quite a few of our grantees apply directly to the NEA, um, you know, through their eligibility criteria and, and, and everything else, but they, they're grantees of both us and the NEA um, for a number of, of organizations, that's true. Um, synergies with the NEA, we, we are a grantee of the NEA. We uh, participate in uh, sessions that they hold uh, through the National Art Assembly for State Arts Agencies and directly from the NEA as well. Um, a lot of the synergies happen around this new uh, folk and traditional art program, plus what we do in our, uh, in our arts education areas, um, Poetry Out Loud program, um, and a few of our uh, grant programs also draw from NEA funds um, that happen in arts education. So the synergy is built in. The structure is such that we belong to a group of uh, state arts agencies that are NEA grantees. Um, I think that's that's the straightforward answer to that. If I if I remember correctly, if, I, if I'm uh, thinking. Thank correctly, you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, yes, Thank sir. you, Haran. I was going to say uh, in our granting process both when people are not successful in the process and we give them coaching afterwards about how they can improve the application the next year, or in cases where the amount of funding they want exceeds what we can do, but there are other agencies and other sources of funding we could point them towards. I know we've done some of that, and I think we intend to do more of that. And that's when this network of sister organizations, NEA and other organizations, we can say, here's what we can do for you, but here's how we could counsel you or guide you or direct you towards other sources of funding, given what your need is and given your qualification. So I know we've done a fair amount of that, but we intend to try to do more of that as well mm -hmm. to, again, teach them to fish, not just give them fish and give them access to broader counsel around funding sources in addition to our funding source. Mm -hmm. Like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is another YouTube question. Is there a CAH support group or Facebook group to help people apply past grantees offering tips and info? Um, that's an interesting idea to explore. We normally um, have workshops and uh, technical assistance and one on one support um, as, once the grant uh, programs are open. We provide that kind of support uh, for potential part, um, applicants. Um, I don't know offhand of any grantee group that's been set up. Um, we have talked in the past about um, having an alumni sort of grantee fellows or individuals, sister city uh, grantees and alumni type of uh, group that could keep in touch, keep in touch and, and learn about each other's uh, um, works, you know, over time, but also uh, give each other tips on on a successful application from from within the agency. There are staff members that do this as part of their work to um, uh, support part, um, applicants um, in the process. So I don't know if fa Facebook groups might be another way to try and do the same thing. Um, but we have a number of workshops every time that our grant cycles are open that provide that kind of information from the agency. Yep, and this is on the spot, so Iran may send me a lightning bolt through uh, the computer when I say this, but we are going to create a program that we call a mentor protege program that allows organizations, grantees and others who have skills and resources as a mentor that they can share with other organizations as a protege. This notion of uh, that you just talked about, the, the sort of grouping uh, people who want to get in could be a part of that program. Right now, what we thought about is there are people that have capacity building skills around uh, development and fundraising, around audience development, around innovative programming, around staff development and enhancement. And those can be both large organizations and small organizations that have those skills that can become mentors to protege organizations that need those skills. And what we want to do is create a program that will fund that sort of activity. And so it's not just an outside consultant working with a grantee. It is one grantee working with another grantee uh, because they have experienced these things. And again, you know, a large organization may be able to help a small organization with 
uh, their fundraising, building their fundraising team, but a small organization that has to figure out in a number of way how to drive programming and diverse programming may be able to help innovative programming to a large organization. So there's no bias large versus small. It really is the skill base that is being mentored to the protege. So I think that entire program is wanting to be developed and could address the question that was just raised. Mm -hmm. And I think even beyond that also, I would add, Reggie, that the we we can play a bigger role in, in convening uh, different groups. I think that's an area that we haven't explored fully or we've done it in bits and pieces. But um, there are a number of, you know, sort of groups that would become natural cohorts really around right. um, um, topic areas and whatever. So just even convening those groups and allowing the conversations to take place um, is, is another role that we can explore and, and look to do. Yep. And this is in the category of beyond just funding, how can we be helpful? How can we be that convener that brings people together and, and matches up uh, one organization to another, one artist to another? Uh, so that is all part of this, what I call mentor protege program that we're developing now. Thank you. So uh, traditionally, um, universities have been inel ineligible to apply to CAH for grant funding. Do you foresee this policy changing to include the creative economies and artistic think tanks on local uh, university campuses? I think the idea behind how the grant programs are structured in general, I'm not spe speaking specifically, it is to provide resources for folks that don't have other means. Um, universities mostly are, are, you know, do have some funding within their structures um, for some of the arts work that they do. They have their departments, they have their uh, programs. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the idea of keeping this for nonprofits and for individual artists is one that is strong because particularly those sectors don't have a whole lot of options uh, for public funding um, for the arts. And so, at least the, the existing thinking has been, I think, this has been a policy forever, but I don't know, you know how it came about. But, 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 but if I were asked, I'd say that's probably why. Um, but maybe it's something that the commission might consider. Reggie, I don't know if you might have a thought. I, I agree. I agree. I mean, it's, it's a new idea, so I'd have to think more about it, but I think it's something we definitely must consider. Good. Uh, one more uh, question about uh, possible grant changes. This one is about FAB. Uh, is there any thinking going on right now about possible changes to the traditional FAB grant program? Uh, because uh, you know, securing long-term space uh, is still a, a big challenge for a lot of organizations here in DC. Mm -hmm. And that that goes to sort of the changes in the city in general. The um, the pressures that small and medium sized organizations are facing um, with increasing gentrification and neighborhood changes um, is is very real. Um, we, you know, council has legislated 17% of our budget for facilities and buildings, um, mainly originally for uh, maintenance and uh, um, um, projects that that you know lease and and uh, uh, maintenance uh, projects for for organizations um, and we have expanded that to include infrastructure websites um, technology uh, use uh, as part of infrastructure um, so we've made some progress with council also again kind of bringing uh, the, the the idea of uh, relief funding for organizations um, in these time, in this time of need, through that facilities and buildings um, um, grant program, so it's it's an ongoing conversation. It's it's several sort of viewpoints and vantage points coming um, into that conversation. Council uh, sees this as an investment um, into the uh, into the arts a particular way. Uh, we see the needs from you know small organizations all the way to large organizations. What can this grant program do? And so um, it's it, it's it's as is for now. Uh, it doesn't mean it it isn't open for. Uh, we're not open for conversation, or or we can't take some of the ideas back to council. So um, it's to be continued, I think. 
Uh, one more from YouTube here. Has CAH ever considered establishing arts incubator or WeWork collaborative working style spaces for the arts uh, so that DC artists are, artists have places to work and develop and rehearse together? That's a good question too. I think part of that, part of that can be addressed through uh, the mentorship style of program, capacity building program that Reggie spoke about. Uh, there may be opportunity for space sharing that we can think about there that would make sense uh, to bring, you know, to be able to um, have, uh, I know theaters, for example, go go dark on, on Mondays. They're not active on Monday nights. Uh, so there may be opportunities. There's costs involved as well, of course, but opportunities to um, share resources uh, as it relates to space. Um, we have, I know in the past, you know, been concerned around uh, managing real estate, um, being able to uh, bring that onto our portfolio uh, has been a concern. It's it's an area that we have felt that we're not best suited to um, to uh, take on. Uh, but there may be opportunities. I'm thinking uh, broadly now of working with DIMPED, for example, or agencies that manage real estate in the district mm -hmm. to uh, look at possibilities of um, uh, you know sort of making those spaces available for for collaborative work or, or um, incubators or even pop-ups um, as as needed so those would be those would be the ideas I think that we could pursue yeah I remember doing the work of the task force on equity inclusion and belonging this topic came up I can't recall if it found its way into a specific recommendation. But certainly that from an equity standpoint, uh, this is an issue that we need to try to find a way to address, if not directly, perhaps in partnership with someone else or to be that broker that connects people or convenes people in some sort of way, but to somehow touch this issue because it is a big issue. I know mm -hmm. it for certain. And even affordable but, housing for artists. I mean, as new developments right. take place across the city, you know, what can we do to push that that you know, as part of a package that a developer takes on, that there is affordable housing for artists considered in in those uh, projects as well. So it's work that we'll do with DIMPED probably is what I'm thinking. I think that might be uh, about it for right now. There was a few specific uh, grant questions that we might need to follow up with people on uh, directly after afterwards uh, who had already applied. Okay. Well, Question. as we yes, please. Chuck Hicks. Hey there. Hi. I got three quick questions. One is yes, that sir. would the commission consider uh, maybe having a one day conference with all the skills so that people could go to different ones that they were interested in, you know, for uh, a day? So that if I was interested in fundraising or if I was in, interested in capacity building, there would be somebody there for an hour and a half or two hours to, uh, to be in that conference. You know, sometimes we have these big meetings, but sometimes smaller conferences would work better for a lot of us. That's My sense. other question would be, what is the concept of working together in terms of collaboration or partnerships when uh, for the commission in terms of groups, two or three groups coming together to want to do a project. Is there a possibility for that kind of program and support? Uh, it's good to have you here, Mr. Hicks. I, I don't know that such a possibility exists right now. What exists is our project events and festivals uh, grant program that allows for you know uh, collaboration among organizations, but organizations to suggest projects uh, through but it's it's an idea. I know our our uh, grants committee chair uh, Gretchen Wharton is on this call, and she, along with me, are probably taking uh, notes as we're talking because these are good new ideas to explore. Uh, I can't say that that possibility exists right now, but um, given you know, as the as the ideas come and as the need expresses itself, these are these are things that we'll take into consideration and in sort of responding to it. So I'll say I, I particularly you. love I love this it, not job fair, but skills fair mm -hmm. suggestion you made at the beginning. I think that is very doable and could be a way to scale getting that across. So thank you for that suggestion. Mm -hmm. My last question 
is that, you know, I've oftentimes advocated for our CBOs, small community-based organizations that don't have space, they don't have staff, but they want to do things in the art. And it seems that it's very difficult if, to get a piece of the art pie if you're not kind of an And I'm not saying that we don't need what we have because uh, the, the artists who are artists need to have all that they need. But in terms of relating to groups in the community who might want to do something, uh, might want to put together a project, uh, how do we begin to include them? Sometimes I find that different community groups don't feel they have a shot at it. And one of the things sometimes is that, say for the community group, they might not have a 5013C, so automatically they're just left out. Uh, so how do we begin to include smaller community organizations who have art interests and uh, but don't fit into this big picture? Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, as we get a better understanding of, of uh, who those groups are, what the uh, what the need is, what what direction they're going in, I think an idea to consider might be. Um, you know, sort of smaller grants that can just provide maybe seed money uh, right. for, you know, s projects, neighborhood, community projects that are important, really important uh, to, to that's the grassroots level. I mean, that's that's sort yes. of where, you know, neighborhoods, kids come out and it's it's not, sig the significance shouldn't be based on a size or a scope. Um, because those are the pieces that provide the stitches to community. That's what glues, you know, c c uh, keeps the community together in many ways. So it's a challenge you're putting before us, uh, Mr. Hicks, and I think we need to think about it. We need to think well, about how do we serve those communities in yeah, the way that they wondered, need to be served. I wonder, maybe it's a three, and this is just off the top of my head, but maybe it's a three-step process that we do convenings that bring together all these interested parties to talk about this. And out of that, we identify where can we help them in a grant way, in a capacity building way, et cetera. And then perhaps third, assign them in this mentor protege program so a real person can work with them to help them build up their. Because some of these existing organizations started off just like that mm -hmm. and have that experience. Excellent. You can say what it's like not just to be there, but how you get there from having started in a different place. We need to think more about it, but perhaps it's a three step process. I like. I it. certainly would like to volunteer to work on that. All Great. right, we have you, you down. <laughs> on, thank you. All thank right, you. thank you. Me thank too. You. Um, I'm in need of mentorship. Okay. <laughs> yes. I'm writing you so, down. <laughs> Good to see you too, Asipula. I have a uh, suggestion. Yes, I do. Um, speaking, please. During the. Um, uh, past administration when there was a significant jobs program, the Comprehensive Employment and Training Act, there were artists all over the nation that were being hired and artist jobs. Um, there will be some sort of uh, national jobs program that um, will be in place in the in the future as the national government moves forward on this. DC had a very successful program uh, here in Washington, DC. It was called the CETA and the Arts Program. And I would like to suggest that the commission start a working group now um, to work with um, the, the um, uh, workforce agency uh, to begin talking about this so that you are getting ready for it rather than waiting on everything to happen. I would be more than happy to work on that. I worked on it on the national level as well as the local level here in DC. Great. Thank you so much, George. And I know you've shared some of that those documents with me in the past, so I appreciate you bringing it back into this conversation because it's it aligns really well. And I know you've you have you've had really good experience with uh, working with these programs before. So we'll definitely pull you into that that broader conversation. Thank you. So we got a couple more here uh, real quick. Um, does CAH work with business improvement districts, bids, and artists and art are really business retention, attraction efforts and initiatives? Mm. 
we work through bids uh, through our public art program. Um, they apply to grants and uh, and partner with us in neighborhood uh, public art projects. Uh, we also kind of by extension through DSLBD work with bids during our art all night programming, which grew and grew this year. It was at about uh, nearly 20 locations um, uh, this year. Um, there has been conversation through the public art master plan uh, engagement, community engagement in looking at how can we work closely, more closely with bids in uh, in uh, providing support and uh, programming um, uh, monies to to some of the projects that uh, we could do together. So um, we do to a certain extent, but there's always room for more of that to happen. Um, that's what I would I would say. Does CAH offer any networking opportunities for artists and arts administrators? I'm so glad you're asking. As we're beginning uh, our community engagement uh, ramp up for January now, uh, uh, our planning, we have a number of staff members who are uh, thinking through networking opportunities. Uh, we will do some in person uh, just because, you know, things are opening up. Um, we will host a few of these virtually. Um, we'll continue to do that because I think there is a real interest around networking opportunities for artists uh, just artists to be able to talk to each other think of collaborations you know uh, keep keep tabs on who's doing what and learning from each other uh, but I, we'd be very interested in in, in uh, doing more of those networking sessions would CH be able to do a uh, a grant series that had rolling due dates uh, throughout the years so that uh, artists could apply uh, multiple times, uh, different times throughout the year. I don't know the answer to that. The reason being that our our budget cycles are pretty prescriptive. They they run, you know, the the cycles that they run uh, across district government agencies. Uh, payment processing takes a long time. We don't cut checks from the commission. We do it with other sister agencies, and so. Um, having it on a rolling basis may may present some challenges um also just capacity you know having folks that can process applications and uh awards and reports and uh so i think maybe the thinking there would be to mm -hmm. uh, look at relief type of grants these quick type of grants that we can yeah. um mm -hmm. put together to um to support artists uh, at different points of their journey um that's exactly there are challenges thinking, yeah, yeah i was thinking in the relief context if we had some set aside to be put in that category so that throughout the year the money is there but the process is a different process than the traditional grant process right. so i think this right. i know Hesham is listening this is one of the things that the grant committee as they think of how we rethink our grant making process needs to look at because we know the needs don't just come once a year at a particular time. And so we've got to find a way as best we can to better accommodate the through the year thing, not every day, not every month, but some sort of process that mm. it happens throughout the year. Thank you. Thank you. And um, the relief, there was a relief uh, and recovery grant um, that the commission on arts and humanities put together uh, earlier this year. Thank you. Um, and then the suggestion, you know, it's not a this or that kind of suggestion. Um, in addition to having the, you know, certain grants that happen, uh, you have to get the paperwork in. In addition to that, let's do all of the above. Let's add also some additional grants that are just, or some avenues that are just open on a rolling basis. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. the suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, Matipula. I think the, you know, the, given that these are public funds with their own sort of requirements of reporting and uh, accounting for, uh, that's the piece that we, uh, 
uh, we are, you know, we grapple with when uh, we can't be so nimble or there's a limit to how nimble we can be sometimes, but it isn't an either and or, or, you know, it should be a little bit of everything that can support folks different ways. So I appreciate the, uh, the idea. Thank you. Thank you. I hear South Africa in there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, east of the river is creating an arts and culture district to amplify the rich arts and culture there. What kind of guidance, et cetera, might CH provide? Engage with us. We have um, staff members who are working in, in uh, Ward 7 and 8 uh, on with some grantees already. But um, as, as you begin to, um, you know, sort of start that co collective conversation, um, come to us and 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 let's talk through what what makes sense, what support, what partnering, what convening, what resource uh, we can make available. Um, that it's exciting to hear that there is um, an initiative already. But uh, because we are now sort of looking at all of our grant programs and and having conversations, it's a really good time to come to the commission meeting or uh, reach out to staff and. Let us know what what you're working on, so we can see where best you know we can we can support. I think that might be it for that I have on my screen. Okay, it's actually we're making good time. Um, I'm happy to pop back our uh, last couple of of. Uh, slides, which are really sort of announcement slides. Thank you, everyone. It's been really good to uh, share and hear, you know, uh, your ideas and thoughts. Uh, we, uh, the staff and the commissioners, if I may speak on behalf of everyone, have always, you know, there's deep love and commitment for this community uh, here. There's deep um, uh, expertise and knowledge um, in 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 supporting the success of our artists and our arts and humanities organizations. So think of us as partners. Uh, we've heard the word grantee partners being used in one of the sessions we've had with um, uh, a, a foundation, the Ford Foundation. Uh, we like that idea of grantee partners. We are in this together and we should uh, really approach it with that spirit of openness uh, and and partnership. And so I say thank you uh, to, and I'll give Reggie a, a moment to, to do the same, but I'll, I'll go through the next couple of slides, which are just announcing slides, announcement slides about a couple of, of events that are, uh, or activities that are happening on our end. Uh, the, the DC Art Now um, uh, exhibition uh, features district artists. It's our art exhibition grant, and, and we provide an opportunity to put up an exhibition that uh, shows all of the works that are being considered for uh, acquisition for our collection. And so we have it up on our uh, I Street galleries here at the office. The gallery has been fantastically restored. The lighting is amazing. The ceiling has been repaired. And so please, it's open during office hours all day, every day. So please come through to see uh, the exhibition. It's a really, really beautiful exhibition. And uh, we hopefully might be able to host, given um, the building's restrictions and whatever, if that works out, we might be able to host a couple of um, talks or, or uh, uh, presentations, curatorial presentations for this, uh, for this exhibition. We'll have it up until early December. So please, if you're in the area, or even if you can make plans to come through, please come through. Um, our second slide after this is, uh, and actually give it, <laughs> I don't even know. I think we shouldn't share the second slide because there may be a slight change in the in the uh, uh, in the meeting date for the commission. Um, and so we will we will <laughs> we will notify you uh, as to when the next um, it will be the the week of uh, November fifteenth will be our commission meeting. And so we will love to have you there. Come through, sign up and 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 uh, talk to us, keep in conversation with us. Uh, I'll stop there, and and uh, Reggie, maybe you you you'll close us out. Yes, well, well, thank you. I mean, first, thank you to the over 100 people who participated today, and for the great questions and engagement. And keep us honest on this. Our intention is to address as many issues and opportunities as we can. Uh, so your participation is important. 
your active participation is important. I, I certainly have to thank Haran and the staff for the um, liberating view of the world and what is before us and what we can do that has been so refreshing and inviting for me. And certainly I have to thank my fellow commissioners who have been right along in the journey and um, encouraging me and us to do those things that add value to the arts and humanities community in Washington, D.C. So I'm excited. I'm charged up. Um, even though my boat is small and the ocean is big, I'm determined for us to plow through and get some amazing things done with everyone's involvement. So, so thank you for helping drive this collective agenda and for your active participation. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Reggie. Yes. Right. Let me just say that I think on behalf of many of the citizens of Washington, we appreciate what the commission does. I know you often don't do that, but I know it's a tireless job that you're incredibly busy and that we want to be there to support it any way that we can. And to our new chair, we're excited about having you and uh, getting to know you. And I'm hopeful that sometime in the uh, spring or so, we will put together, and I will help work with this, a meet the director reception uh, so that you, people from the community Community can come together, not only meet the, uh, the director, but the board. Uh, we, that would be just a wonderful community thing to do. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you. I know I you, you have been at this for so long, and I am always inspired when I'm able to attend the events that you put together, the kinds of community members you pull in. It, I, I always feel so energized uh, by being there and by, you know, even after. Um, so I really appreciate your welcome of, of uh, our new chair and, 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 and that you notice the work that goes into this. So I, thank you. Really, thank you for that comment. And thank you to staff. Staff is always, you know, very seldom do you see them. They're, they're kind of the invisible hands that make these things work. Um, thank you to our ASL interpreters today and to all of the commissioners who've been, uh, you know, sort of guiding all of this forward. We look forward to more. We hope to do at least another couple of our uh, teletown halls, maybe one a quarter or so at minimum, uh, where we'll engage in a, in a similar way. So please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very, very much for your uh, comments and for your questions, and we look forward to more in partnership. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Stay safe. Stay Stay strong. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.